Welcome, everybody, to this uh, special episode of the Ninth Grade Experience podcast. Uh, normally, we focus on students and and things going on within our school, but today we're, we have a special guest that's a pretty big deal, and I'm going to read all some accomplishments before I introduce her name first. So um, this is the embarrassing part. I'm sure you have to deal with this all the time, so I'm sure you've figured out a way to take this with, with grace at this point. So our guest today is a New York Times bestseller. She wrote this book here that you can see if you're watching the video, The Gift of Failure, uh, how the best parents learn to let their let go so their children can succeed. She has a new book coming out in April of 2021 called The Addiction Inoculation, Raising Healthy Kids in a Culture of Dependence, which she's holding up on her end. Um, she's been on several different podcasts that I listen to all of these, Armchair Expert with Dax Shepard, The Rich Roll Podcast, The Daily Stoic Podcast with Ryan Holiday. She was a presenter at South by Southwest EDU. She's a keynote speaker. She also had a run this summer where she was on Kristen Bell's Instagram for her book. And her name is Jessica Leahy. She's here to join us today. So Jessica, thanks a lot for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. And the way I get through that is that um, someone pointed out to me that you should be proud of the things that you have accomplished and that when you make those horrible faces like, oh gosh, <laughs> don't tell those things that you start to look like a weirdo, like you're not proud of what you've accomplished. And I am proud of what I've accomplished and I've been very fortunate, but I'm also very proud of what I've accomplished. So I try to just be a good sport during that stuff. And in all those different, all the different podcasts, you talk about how you've gotten to be on those, some of those things. So we're not going to go into those details today, but if you want to find out how she wound up on a, you know, a podcast that has hundreds of thousands of listens, you know, she tells the story about how she got onto Dax Shepard's podcast, and it's pretty, pretty well documented how long that took you to do. But my two first years, question, two yep. years, <laughs> and I feel I feel pretty good because I, I only uh, sent you a message like two weeks ago, so I don't know. I guess I'm, I'm guess I'm winning out here. So uh, before we get into the real questions, I always like I had Brian Koppelman on my podcast during the pandemic. And I, same thing, I just sent him a random email. You he's, know, and he's such the producer, a lovely guy. He's the producer of Billions, this guy in Hollywood. And I asked him the same question at the start. Why come on a little podcast from a teacher, a ninth grade teacher in Emmaus, Pennsylvania, that's right outside of Allentown? Like, what is it, what's in it for you as, you know, somebody that's out there on a national level that, you know, has thousands of followers on Twitter, has been all over the world? Like, what's, why come on to this show? Well, because, well, for me, I mean, I'm assuming my question, my answer is different from Brian's because I don't think Brian has ever been a teacher, but you know, I was a teacher for 20 years. I'm not teaching right now only because by the way, my, um, my position as a teacher in an inpatient drug and alcohol rehab was they just got rid of all the teachers because they turned the adolescent wing into an adult wing, but I've taught every grade from six to 12 and there's hardly anything I like talking about more, maybe writing, which is why I have a whole podcast about that. But teaching, um, you know, as my husband said, when I first started writing about it, and I said, you know, I just don't know what to write about next. I had, had written this book and it didn't get published and it shouldn't have been because it was terrible. But I said, I don't know what to write about next. And he said, well, the thing that makes you light up inside is teaching. And when you write and talk about teaching, you just are your you have your best, most authentic, excited, happy voice. And so, you know, I can talk about teaching all day long and, and hardly anything makes me happier than that. So any opportunity to do that, I'm, I, I welcome. And it's the, one of the reasons that I was intrigued. I, you know, I follow you on Twitter. We've actually had some communication previously, like very briefly. Um, one of the reasons that I'm excited to have you on is because for our podcast, you've done, you've taught at the ninth grade level. You mm -hmm. have had children that have gone at the ninth grade level since yep. I think they're all older than that. And you've obviously yep. been a ninth grader at one point. So <laughs> we always ask everyone on the show, the first question, if they're a new guest and they never have to identify the year or where they were located. But the first question is always, can you describe your ninth grade experience? Since that's what we focus on here for our students in our own high school and what they're going through and how to transition into high school. We always like to find out what that experience was like for them and then kind of try to draw some comparisons to what they're going through and, and if you see any parallels or, or comparisons from that. Happy to say where and when. It would have been 1984-85. So I was deep into, you know, came off of middle school during the whole like worst era of 80s music. So like the <laughs> dances were like those really like, Oh, the music was so bad. And, and uh, I, my ninth grade picture, I was actually wearing a V-neck sweater and a, and a tie, a skinny tie. You know, it was a really <laughs> fantastic era. Um, 
And I went to Dover Sherburn High School just outside of Boston. So I was very fortunate. It's a school system that's just fantastic. And the, the what you know, there's a lot of reasons it's fantastic. It's a, a lot of it has to do with pro the, you know, high property taxes and stuff like that and the wealth in that area. But the teachers that I had were so fantastic with very few exceptions. Um, I loved school and ninth grade was super scary. Um, you know, from our middle school, we could look across the, the field and see the high school. Now also dating myself, I knew they had a smoking lounge over there for <laughs> the high schoolers. And that was one of the things that made it scary to me. Like they can smoke over there. That's the place where the grown up people are. And it was, um, it was intimidating, but I, I loved everything about every year of high school. I was a big dork. I loved it. I enjoyed school. I loved learning. So I was very lucky. It's always interesting when talking to the adults on our podcast, they can always, no matter how old they are, they can always kind of think back to like one ninth grade experience that they had that kind of still mm -hmm. sticks out to them and maybe even kind of directed them to where they eventually wound up later in life, whether it was teaching or another career or whatever they were doing. Do you have any recollection of a specific ninth grade event or a club or an organization that you were a part of that kind of maybe without knowing it at the time kind of led your direction to where you are today? Here's the thing about my high school experience. 10th grade was an incredibly formative year for me. Um, it was a really important year for me and it tends to overshadow a lot of my memories of ninth grade. I had an art teacher that was a kind of a legend and he died a bunch of years ago. He just was a wonderful, wonderful man. And he was one of those people who took students seriously and listened to them and he, although I wasn't a great artist or anything, he was one of those people that I was so grateful that he was my homeroom teacher and that he was my um, sort of there near me all the time to be able to talk to. And I, I, he was one of the only teachers I ever had who took the time to look students in the eye and talk to them about their problems as if they were problems that mattered. And that has stuck with me for a really long time. He's... Um, you know, it was devastating for a lot of us when he died. Um, his name was Mr. Burbank, or Burbs, as we called him. And, uh, and I think the reason that so many people miss him the way they do is that he, he treated us like human beings and not like kids. And that, that has shaped a lot of my teaching, I think. And it's, it's, it's always, you know, it's never, and we'd say this all the time too, even as like amongst ourselves as teachers, like it's never like your recollection isn't about like, oh, they were the best at teaching, you know, the mm -hmm. quadratic equation. They weren't the best at teaching, breaking down a sentence. It's always about, you know, and even what you just said there was kind of that, like the personal connection. It's the, you know, mm -hmm. the thing that you remember, like the, the connection that you made with that person. So it's always interesting when we talk to adults, it's never that, you know, we, we think as teachers in it, you know, in the moment, it's like, oh my gosh, we have to plan the perfect lesson. We have to plan the perfect this. And, but it's 99 times out of 100, it seems to always be the connections that you make with kids. And I know there's a lot of stuff in your book and things that you write about that are about those connections and, and that, those kinds of things. But it just always comes back to that idea that it's the connections with the kids that kind of is the starting point, And then you can mm -hmm. kind of branch off from there. Yeah. In fact, a lot of kids would go to his classroom during their lunch period as a refuge. If you were having a hard time, that was the place you know. You could just say to the lunch people or to wherever you were supposed to be, I'm going to art class to get some extra work done. And that was a catch-all for, I just need some time with someone who gets it. And, um, you know, I have no idea if there were professional, you know, I, I do know that he did tend to break some rules. I seem to recall students smoking with him occasionally. <laughs> um, again, this is 1984-85, um, but, you know, I'm assuming that was as, would have been as against the rules, you know, as it is now. But at the, on the other hand, you know, I, I think that it was understood that he went above and beyond for us because he, not because he was trying to be cool or because he was really getting off on the fact that we liked him and we thought he was the cool teacher, but because he knew it was important and, and he liked us and he wanted to be there for us. And that model of, you know, you can be this generous person with your time without it being about what people think of you, but because you're there for the students. And I think some teachers tend to get caught up in that whole, you know, I want to be buddies with my students and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And that's, I've always understood that line, I think, because of this guy, because of this particular guy. 
So um, kind of getting into the beginnings here of like, since you have uh, working with students, you have a lot of research on students and, and kind of the things that are, have allowed them to be successful, you know, trying to draw that comparison between your ninth grade experience and to what students are going through now. Like, obviously we have COVID, we have all those different things. And, and, you know, that's a whole nother, that's its own podcast, its own book, all those different things. That story is still kind of being written, but in your research and in the kind of things you looked at as a student in ninth grade, what are like some of the tips or strategies or things that you kind of picked up in your research? And there's a small part in your book. There's a couple of pages in the book that's devoted specifically to ninth grade, but kind of what have you seen or important things for ninth grade students that are listening, like things that they can be like look on the lookout for or things that will help them as they kind of progress through their ninth grade year and through high school. I think revealing why I write so little about ninth grade reveals a lot about the advice I would give, which is my favorite grades to teach are seventh and eighth and 10th and 11th. Something about the transitional years and, and eighth grade is a transitional year, but I think I like it for different, for very specific reasons, but I find ninth grade and 12th grade and ninth grade in particular, and I hate to say this, but ninth grade out of every grade from six to 12th is my least favorite grade to teach. And the reason for that is that it's an incredibly um, difficult year. I think a lot of schools do it poorly. Um, I've uh, The school where I taught ninth grade uh, didn't do a lot of differentiating levels. Um, not that, you know, I think we should be striating, you know, sorting kids out and putting, you know, kids in various levels. But I think this a lot of kids were pretty bored. Ninth grade was a pretty generic sort of intro, like we're just getting used to it kind of thing, as opposed to taking advantage of what's best about ninth grade, which is this transition from, you know, middle school where, you know, the you're finally starting to get a hang of all of the things that we're asking you to do, like the changing classes and all that stuff. But then you're also layering that on top of a bottom of the heap social structure. So for me, um, there's a school outside of Boston called Belmont Hill School. It's a private school for boys. The thing I've always loved, the reason I like Belmont Hill School's middle school structure is that it goes through ninth grade. I think ninth grade would could be such a great year if there were leadership opportunities for ninth graders. I think any leadership opportunities you can give for ninth graders, even though because they constantly, and I know I did, perceived myself to be like unworthy of attention, bottom of the heap, um, just easing myself in. But if I had had the opportunity to sort of be a part of clubs and groups in a way that gave me responsibility and leadership opportunities, I think it would have gone a long way to setting the stage for 10th, 11th, and 12th grade. Mm -hmm. um, I've always sort of talked about the, the experience I've had ninth grade, teaching ninth grade students is there's this deer in the headlights experience where they're just trying like like crazy just to do everything right. Plus they're worried about people looking at them at, in the halls. I remember my son's very first day of, my older son's very first day of ninth grade, the school that he went to initially had this horrible tradition of hazing the, the freshmen. Um, and he came home and he said, I am exhausted. And I said, why? And did anything happen to you specifically? And he said, no, but I was just vigilant all day long. I didn't know if something was going to happen, but it could happen at any minute. And it was going to be terrible. And I was scared and I am exhausted. And he went to sleep and took a nap because he was just so tired from that experience of being bottom of the heap and feeling looked at all, all day long and not feeling like he had a lot of power or um, role to play. So give ninth graders more roles, give them more responsibility give them more leadership opportunities. And it's interesting, you, you brought up the deer in the headlights thing. That's, uh, I wrote down that that was the subtitle of the ninth grade section in your book. And I was going to ask about like that a whole idea, like right, literally I was like looking at it and I'm like, got to ask it. And then you're like deer in the headlights. So of course yeah. you brought it right up naturally. Um, but like, so how do you balance, and this is kind of an, I don't know if this is an answerable question, but you have the balance of like the deer in the headlights versus the need for a little bit more authority or like leadership positions. Is there a way that you would recommend for like schools or parents or so, or whoever's involved to kind of balance those two things out? Yeah, I think, well, because one of the things I think about a lot with, with freshmen in particular is the ninth graders is that um, there's, 
there's really great research on learned helplessness that, um, you know, when we're sort of in this position of being hypervigilant, in pain, suffering, whatever, over the long term, our natural instinct as human beings is to kind of roll up into a ball and just sort of, you know, hope it'll go away or go helpless. And the cool thing about in the research on this is that the way to um, short circuit that automatic response is to give more control. So the way to make people feel more helpless and less out of control is to give them some control. So give them junior leadership positions, create, you know, uh, that's why I think there's this feeling that like the people who are in the, um, the uh, student council in leadership positions in ninth grade just have it more together or have like some eagle eye view on what it means to be a ninth grader is that they're, they're the kind of people who rise up to, you know, leadership positions. But I think we should have those throughout the structure of the ninth grade year. I think it would be a really great, if you had clubs that were sort of, you know, you have a representative for each grade and that they all have the ability to, um, to have a say in how things are run. I just think that that giving control, giving some autonomy, giving some, you know, some ways for kids to lead within the, within the context of being the youngest kids on the block. I think that could really help a lot in terms of confidence and competence. And I think it's really interesting. Like one of the things we always talk about is like getting involved, like as a ninth grader, getting involved in your school as best you can. And mm -hmm. whether it's just being involved or having that leadership role, it's like, it just seems like we've done like over about 50 episodes now. And every time we talk to a student, the student is involved in like three or four different things. Like they seem to have them going, like they're the busiest kids, but they seem to have the most kind of together, you know, uh, social and, and academic kind of structure going on. They've kind of had to learn on their own to kind of figure out how to get rid of that deer in the headlights look and kind of be involved and, and kind of figure, keep on that like momentum from middle school to high school, which I, we always find is interesting kind of that, you know, it's, it's never like the kid that like is just doing well academically. It's like they're involved mm -hmm. in all their stuff. They kind of want to be involved in their school. You know, we encourage that as much as we can. So, yeah. And I think I, and the, my caveat for my statement about the fact that ninth grade is my least favorite grade to teach. I think if I spent more years, I, I've only done it once. And I think if I spent a couple more years in ninth grade, I probably would fall in love with them too. But I've spent the most time with, you know, seventh and eighth and ninth and 10th. And so those groups are really close to my heart. But I, I bet you anything, if I were to spend a couple of years in ninth grade, I would, I would fall in love as well. So as a teacher, and I know, you, you know, just speaking that you didn't really teach ninth grade a whole lot, but as a teacher, if you were to recommend to a teacher of ninth graders, what they should be attempting to do for their students, you know, obviously giving them those, you know, abilities to be, you know, independent, like pick work, do those kinds of things. But, mm -hmm. you know, as somebody maybe, maybe even from the perspective of a 10th grade or 11th grade teacher, like what should a ninth grade teacher be, you know, putting in place during those years, that year to kind of get kids ready to continue on with their education while also like kind of, you know, making it the best ninth grade year for them too? Yeah, I think we do. Um, and this is a bit of a, also a statement to um, hopefully if any parents hear this, the parents of kids that are in eighth grade, that what they're often um, in middle school, we tend to give kids a lot of breaks and sort of really support them a lot, especially when it comes to um, any sort of um, plans they have for special needs. Um, we tend to support them, support them, support them without giving them the benefit of backing off on that scaffolding a little bit so that when they do go to ninth grade, um, especially since some of the stuff that we tend to overcompensate for in, in middle school and give them a lot of support for in middle school, they then don't get as much support for in high school. Um, I think it's going to be really important to give kids, especially at the beginning of the year in ninth grade, give kids a little bit of a break, understanding that some of them are coming from middle schools, especially in like a regional, um, I've, I've taught in a bunch of regional schools where there are kids coming from different schools, um, that they may have had a lot more support in eighth grade than they will get in ninth grade. And so helping taper, helping bridge that gap anyway, is going to be a really important thing. The beginning of the year in ninth grade, I think you've got to spend a lot of time thinking about their mental health, their social emotional learning, and easing into the fact that, yeah, okay, this is high school now and it matters and no one's going to, no one's going to rescue you if you miss that deadline. I think having just a little bit of a cushion where kids can get used to the heightened um, expectations of high school without 
you know, while also dealing with the social stuff and all the other things that are really more challenging about, about heading off to high school. I think that's, that's kind of important. And it's really like that, that conversation, it feels like I have that conversation daily with like, I, I teach with other people. I'm a, a co-teacher, a special education co-teacher. And I feel like we have that conversation all the time about, mm-hmm. you know, too much support versus not enough support, like having mm-hmm. students, you know, be a little bit more independent with their mm-hmm. stuff, like coming up and trying to balance those things. So even like, especially it's, it's, seems to be especially heightened this year more than any other year because of just Mm -hmm. the circumstances of the learning that is going on but it just seems to be that's that like that's like my one wish for students coming up from the eighth grade to ninth grade and kind of implementing that more into our thinking going forward now is just seeing like you know how much the students really are relying upon that middle school model to kind of get them through and then trying to figure out like how can we as ninth grade teachers help them to get ready for ninth grade and beyond too. So again, it's interesting you're saying that just because we're living that now. And and again, not to have like a COVID discussion, but Mm -hmm. that just seems to have heightened exactly what you're saying. Where in previous years, like I've taught ninth grade for several years in a row now, like I think five or six. And this seems to be the year that all of that is now rising to the surface, whether it's because we don't see them in person or they're just so used to having that person right next to them. And now they're at home and they don't have that person. How do they respond? So just, you know, putting that into place as early as possible to kind of help bridge that transition seems to be so important with what. Yeah. There's the, one of the schools where one of my kids went had this really interesting plan. It was sort of a, a plan in the school that wasn't part of, you know, a, a special education official legislated plan, but was more of a, we know you need some support. So we'll just have you on this informal plan for the school where you'll have access to extra support, but it's not like a, because you have a documented learning issue. Um, and it was really nice because the parents could sign their kids up for this and they can wean out of it at any time. And it enabled the kid to just have you know, without having a diagnosis of something, but knowing that they also just need a little bit of help for that first year, it was kind of a nice, uh, a nice cushion, a nice net for them. And uh, you've talked a lot about the transition here to the final group of people that I know that you have had experience with is being a parent of a ninth grader. So we do have parents Mm -hmm. that do listen. So put on your parent hat for a second here (laughs) of like figuring out. So I know a lot of your book is, is, you know, talking to parents and trying to, you know, get them to see a lot of things. So there's about 250 pages in here that the parents can read uh, for all (laughs) different levels. But if you were to give some advice to parents of ninth graders, I think you kind of mentioned that, you know, giving them the independence while giving them the scaffolding as well too. But what are some other things that um, as if a, a ninth grade parent, what should they be on the lookout for? So when my older kid went in, was going into ninth grade, the school held a sort of a thing for parents to come and listen. And yes, there were teachers there and stuff, but what was really effective is they had students there to talk to the parents, to say, one parent asked, you know, okay, so what, as a student, as someone who's recently been a ninth grader, what can we do to be as supportive as possible of our kids? And one girl, she was amazing. She said, you know, don't tell my parents this, but I really do love talking to my parents. I just don't want to talk about school all the time. I don't want to talk about what they want to talk about all the time. So if parents were to close their mouths and open their ears a little bit more and think about, um, you know, maybe talking about the things that your kids want to talk about or listening to the things that your kids might want to just express to you instead of forcing that conversation about how that French test went or, you know, what's on the agenda for next week in English class. Um, I think our kids still need us, um, ninth graders in particular, in that transition period where they think they're supposed to be grown up all the time, but there's still they're still vestiges of those um, middle school kids that still want to hug you and still need a hug sometimes. And the balance there can be tough, but I think if we listen to them and we listen to what's important to them, when we let them lead, I think we'll be in, in good stead. I think that that's the best possible thing we can do. And, and I wrote that down too. Um, that's on page 230 of your book. Again, <laughs> I didn't you realize tell, I was quoting myself. <laughs> you can tell that uh, you've done this. I think the book's about five <laughs> years old now, uh, but you can tell you've, you've talked about some of these talking points in the book because I wrote that down. I was looking through right before we got on to look for the ninth grade stuff. And then I was looking through all the different pages I've eared. 
and I would look and I'm like, oh, there's a quote. And it says, this is a quote from a ninth grader about what ninth graders need. Yeah. And I, I have Well, here's the down. thing. When I, when yeah. I write that stuff, it's because it's an experience that I've had. So I can't draw a distinction between like something I actually wrote down once because considering I've written down most of my experiences at one time or another versus, you know, here's that thing that's in the book on page whatever. Yeah. I still have very fond memories of sitting in that room and thinking, because at the time, all the parents in the room were so holding on so tight and so nervous for their kids to go into ninth grade. And I remember that a bunch of parents, their shoulders kind of just dropped a little bit when she gave that advice, which is that you don't need to do anything other than just shut up and listen to your kid a little bit more, which is kind of reassuring. And you have so many of the, like, I think I've seen you tell that story before on different, you know, different things. You're, you know, you're a lot of your, you know, your talks are on YouTube. So like if people want to find more information, they can definitely check out all those different things and we'll get to that at the end. So you did mention that you do host a podcast. It's called Am Writing. It's with KJ Delantonia, who is now a New York Times bestselling author herself and she Serena is. Bowen, who writes odd romance novels, even though they're regular romance novels. No, and you, can yeah, t- she's, you can tell, you can tell I listened to it a little bit. <laughs> you, yeah. do, you do. So you do. That's excellent. One of the things that you do at the end of your shows usually is you give suggestions where you tell people what you've been reading. So I, I figured yeah. I would ask you here, not necessarily what you've been reading, because I don't know if they need to know the, the latest, you know, romance novel you've been reading. But if you had a suggestion for parents, students, and teachers, each a different one, or it could be the same one and not your own book, Um, Because obviously we want everyone to read that. But if you could suggest uh, a book for each of those different levels or different groups of people that might be interesting to read uh, just to get a little bit more perspective or Mm -hmm. how to tackle that ninth grade year. Well, let's see. There's number one, if you go to jessicalahey.com under the speaking menu option, there's a big button there that says download speaking bibliography. And it has like my best of my greatest hits, the books that I reach for the most. And I think from a parent and teacher perspective, I would have to recommend Make It Stick, the book out of Harvard University Press. It's, they changed the cover. The cover, the version I have is blue with a gold star on the front, mainly because there's discussion in there both of the benefits of desirable difficulties and the benefits of formative assessments. And for it's that's important not only for teachers to understand, but it's also important for parents to understand because it has implications for how we treat kids when they get frustrated over difficult tasks, that it's really important to sort of push them through those tasks. And um, interestingly, I have a book right next to me right now. I interviewed for the podcast um, and you will hear this. I guess if you listen to the hashtag I'm writing podcast, you will hear him eventually. But I interviewed this guy, this guy yesterday, Jacob Sager Weinstein, and he um, wrote this book, How to Remember Everything, tips and tricks to become a memory master. And I reread it the night before I interviewed him. And it's kind of like the memory palace book, except for kids. And um, ideally, I guess this would be sort of a middle school book, but it's really helpful. It makes all of those sort of tips and tricks for how to retain information and how to store information in a way that um, creates more, you know, makes it so that you can retrieve more easily and more durably. it's a really good book. It's a really, really good book. And it's a great book to have just hanging around your classroom because this is a sort of book that someone would pick up like during homeroom or um, in a free moment, maybe during lunch when someone's come to your classroom so to, to you know, have a, a refuge from the cafeteria um, to do things like have abstract clues, intentional cues, enactment cues, and to improve your memory. So for a student, I would, I would hand this book out actually, I have to say. So I know in the in the podcast, I, you haven't done it in a while. So I don't know if maybe just because we can't get, you guys can't get out up there to your local bookstores, but usually they, you plug your local bookstore or your favorite independent mm-hmm. bookstore. Yeah. So I'll give a shout out to ours here. It's Let's Play Books in Emmaus, Pennsylvania. Um, they've had some authors come through and have had signings and other stuff. So uh, they've been on the podcast before with a little commercial and stuff. Not necessarily to like, we've had like book fairs with them. So so if you're listening and you want it, we'll put the books nice. in, the sh- in the notes there, but uh, let's Let's play books in Emmaus, you know, support some local businesses here uh, as we kind of come into the holiday season and afterwards here. So I just wanted to thank you for taking some time out here. Uh, we, you oh, know, I, I, asked, I asked for half an hour and we're up to the half an hour again. It's pretty, 
you know, doing podcasts is pretty cool because like you just sit here and talk. Like I know on yeah. the Rich Roll podcast, he says all the time, like one of the cool things about doing that podcast is you just get to talk to cool people. And yeah. because you have a podcast, the, sometimes they'll agree and sometimes they won't. So I think this is an example for me of just contacting somebody that I really, you know, enjoy their work and think is really relevant in our field today and just reaching out and had a great chance to, to talk with you. So I, I appreciate it. So if you want to find out more about Jessica, you can go. She's on Twitter. Um, she's on Instagram too. And I was going to say, if you want to just follow somebody that's in education, that's on Instagram, but they post nothing about education on it. It's great. Her dogs are great. She posts <laughs> pictures of her out and out in her the backyard in Vermont. And Vermont stuff like, dogs. Yep. Um, my, my game cameras in the woods. I've been trying to find my foxes who lived there last year. Yeah. Yeah. Nothing, uh, nothing serious about education no, on your Instagram no. account. Um, and then your website, which you said, jessicalehi.com. Anywhere else that people should be trying to find you? I know if you're a book reader, Goodreads and all the other stuff there. But anyway, Yeah, I mean, else? those things are all great. But really, it's for me, it's uh, Twitter for fun. And uh, and I and if you go to jessicalehi.com and you happen to sign up there, there's all kinds of freebies that I send out just to people who are um, you know on my mailing list and all kinds of early offers. And I'm going to be sending out some cool pre-order offers for the new book, The Addiction Inoculation. So um, sign up at jessicalahey.com if you want to get some, some stuff no one else will get.